Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. A discarded painting in a junk pile, a skeleton in an attic, and the greatest racehorse in American history. From these strands, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Geraldine Brooks braids a sweeping story of spirit, obsession, and injustice across American history. Her latest novel, Horse, is based on the remarkable true story of the record-breaking 19th century thoroughbred Lexington, who became America's greatest stud sire. Horse is a novel of art and science, love and obsession, the powerful bond between people and animals, and our unfinished reckoning with race and injustice. Geraldine Brooks is the author of the novels The Secret Chord, Caleb's Crossing, People of the Book, and March, which won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Again, her latest is Horse. And it's a pleasure to welcome Geraldine Brooks to this week's book show. Thank you so much for being with us. A delight to have you on the program. Well, thank you for having me, Joe. I love this book so much and am so, we're just so enamored by it. And I, I knew, like you had me just with the subject. And then as I got into it and realized how you were telling the story from these three perspectives and time frames that it just became so fascinating. So let's start there as to the story you stumbled upon and then how you decided you were going to tell it. So I heard about Lexington for the first time at a lunch in 2011, and it was uh, a lunch at Plymouth Plantation, which, as you know, is a wonderful living history museum about the first English settlement on Mm. this continent. And, you know, I was there because um, I had connections at the museum from my previous novel, Caleb's Crossing. And they wanted me to write a similar kind of a book about somebody from the plantation. And so uh, my lunch companion was talking about that idea. But from across the table, I was getting snatches of a conversation that was really fascinating to me. And it was an official from the Smithsonian Institution who was telling how he had just delivered the skeleton of the 19th century's greatest racehorse from Washington to the International Museum of the Horse in Kentucky. And as he regaled his lunch mate with Um, stories of the horse's blistering speed and incredible endurance, and then what happened to the horse during the Civil War. My salad sat uneaten, and my own lunch companion didn't have a scintilla of my attention because (laughs) I just wanted to hear about the horse. So I I had a, a very strong feeling when I left that lunch that this was a story for me. And as I started to look into it, that conviction only deepened because it had so many elements to it, which was the science around the skeleton and and how they do that kind of science at the Smithsonian. And, of course, the story of the racehorse himself, which is full of drama and twists and turns and the incredible human connections of the horse. But then also there's a missing painting of the horse, which is even more fascinating. And that leads us by a circuitous route to the turmoil of the art world in uh, post-World War II New York when Pollock and de Kooning are reinventing our aesthetics. And who knew that that would be connected to a racehorse, but it was. And so it it puts me in mind of what Mark Twain liked to say, that fiction is required to stick to possibilities, but truth isn't. (laughs) (laughs) And when you didn't know the truth, the novelist kicks in and fills in those blanks to the best of your ability. Yeah, that's that's the way I like to work, is to follow the line of fact as far as you can, because the facts will generally be more interesting than anything you can make up. But when that line of fact frays and disappears, then you have to use a novelist's imagination to fill in the gaps in the record. So some of these characters and chords that we're talking about of this 19th century story very much admired in the in the Civil War. We learn about the artist Thomas Scott. We learn about horse owner Richard Tenbrook. 
we learn about the aforementioned New York City art dealer, Martha Jackson. And then there is the young man really at the center of this story who is a the main character and the uh his he and his father take this horse under their wing and Jarrett is really the caretaker of this beautiful animal and yes he is also enslaved so we're following his story as well my understanding is of fact and fiction that Jarrett's story was the one that you really had to do the most fictional work on. Yeah, all we really know about Jarrett is that he existed and that he was the groom of Lexington. And there's a remarkable painting of him done by Thomas Scott. Unfortunately, it's lost. We don't know where it is, but the painting has been described in detail because it was said to be the best painting that Thomas Scott ever did. And it's Lexington being led out by, quote, Black Jarrett, his groom. And I'll tell you, I would give a lot to see that painting mm. because the idea of this young man, this groom, really took hold of my imagination. Because, you know, what I discovered very quickly in researching the life of Lexington was the absolutely central role of skilled black horsemen to the thoroughbred industry of the antebellum period. These guys, um, many of them enslaved or formerly enslaved, were absolutely uh, the, the skilled labor force on which this, um, this pursuit of thoroughbred racing rested. And it was their plundered skills uh, that made it possible for wealthy plantation owners to express you know, their prestige through these racehorses. And, um, you know, it's such a tragic story in a way because I think, you know, anybody who knows anything about horse racing knows that after the Civil War, all these talented black jockeys and trainers were pushed out of that business. So as soon as they were emancipated, it became very unsafe for jockeys to ride with white riders because the white jockeys would gang up and, and um, make it just perilous on the track. So... But that's outside of the scope of this novel. This, this, uh, this novel looks at the time when these black horsemen really occupied a, a central position in a pastime that was, of course, a national obsession at the time. And that was something also that I learned that, you know, this was still a very agrarian society and most people had a horse or knew someone who had a horse and everybody was interested in the racetrack. And it was a very... Um, uh, it, was, it was a place for the elite and the poor and black and white. Everybody gathered there, and the saying was everyone is equal on the turf or under it. What is fascinating is how those matches, if you will, are, are set up, too, because there is a kind of like a, a heavyweight fight or a, um, a P.T. Barnum quality to this where you say, OK, we're going to come to this very large facility. I can fill this with this many people. We'll make money for people buying tickets to get in. And then, of course, we'll make money by people gambling. And we're going to tell them what they're going to see. And they're going to either the horse will break this record. Or the horse will win against this champion. And it, these were very set up events. They were. They were great impresarios, these men. And particularly, I would say, Richard Tenbrook was brilliant at whipping up interest in the races that he uh, he um, directed at his track in New Orleans, the Metairie track. Uh, he made the track wonderful and the pavilions gorgeous and you know was very interested in getting women to come to the races so there were velvet drapes and gilt mirrors and everything you can think of it's a very different scene altogether and and there were great rivalries uh, across states you know they, they would who 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 could breed the fastest horse and so he conceived a race called the great state post stakes and it was really for national supremacy uh, to see whose horse could take on the comers from every other state. And, of course, Lexington um, prevailed. 
One of the things that you tell us, too, it's a surprise for someone like myself who is familiar with horse racing of of what we know of the, the races today, but these horses were going over four miles. I mean, these races were they, incredibly long. They went four miles, and they did it three times in the one day. It was a heat race which is incredible. So if you think about what we consider a long race, the Kentucky Derby, it's what, a mile and a quarter? So it's four times that length, and it's a very different kind of uh, skill to, to be blisteringly fast, but also to have that kind of endurance and the strategy that you know needed to be employed. Um, so it was, it was fascinating, and no wonder people got obsessed with it, because mm. if you were going to go to these races, you'd see your favorite horse have three chances, you know, to win the thing, and uh, and the races themselves were much longer and more intensely exciting, I think. Geraldine Brooks is our guest. The name of the novel is Horse. It is published by Viking. When you look at Lexington, this this horse itself, it is amazing because it is such a a stunning horse, not only for what you just mentioned of being able to run, but to run as fast, the money that the horse made, and how you tell the story. There's there's one segment when when these all of these braids start to come together where you're looking in the Smithsonian trying to figure out why the skeleton has an abnormality to it. And then you bring us back to that moment of Lexington's life while where we learn as to what caused that. That's fascinating that we can, A, know that, as you mentioned earlier in our conversation, but also brings so much to the story of really the what this horse overcame to do the incredible things. That it did. This was a this was an amazingly brave horse, uh, and we know that because uh, when when he broke the speed record, uh, he was running with the racing plates, the shoes, half off his feet. So he must have been in incredible pain. But he just with no uh, this was a race against a stopwatch over four miles and his um, pacemaker horses, he'd left them in the dust long ago, but he just wanted to go and he did, you know. So um, one of the reasons this was this was a book for me to write is because it worked out for this horse. There's great drama and there's, there are setbacks but uh, and dangers uh, overcome, but I'm, it's, not a, it's not a spoiler because we know that he went on to become such a great stud sire. Um, but he actually had a very, he had a good life because he was beloved and everybody was interested in him. And people would come from far and near to admire him, you know, everybody from ex-presidents to uh, General Custer <laughs> came and remarked on what a beautiful horse he right. was. And it was remarkable, I thought, when when the horse goes to stud and obviously is making so much money from that. but. As you talk about uh, the children from Lexington, you there are many familiar names there, including Preakness, which the Preakness Stakes is named after. That is correct. And another four of uh, Lexington's progeny won that race. And the very first Kentucky Derby was won by a son of Lexington, Asteroid, who was trained by the great black trainer Ansel Williams who was enslaved until the Civil War and ridden by ridden to that victory by a black jockey. So, um, you know, there are these incredible stories um, just swirling all, all around Lexington. And the remarkable thing is he was the leading stud sire for 16 years and could have even had more champions except so many of his progeny went off to war and didn't become racehorses. One of them was General Grant's own horse, was a son of Lexington. So it goes in all kinds of directions. 
Bring us just to what we know about the skeleton, which is in and of itself a fascinating story. The horse was originally at the National Museum of Natural History. It was even exhibited outside, right, the Smithsonian? Yes, uh, we think so. Well, there's a photograph of it outside, and it's not clear to me whether that was where it was exhibited or whether it was just on in transit. Mm. <laughs> but in any case, yes, it was a famous exhibit of this particular horse during, you know, the, the time directly following the horse's death when he was still in living memory and still a celebrity. And then over time, you know, his fame waned and the Smithsonian's mission changed to be more of a, more of a scientific institution than a cabinet of curiosities. And then for many years, the skeleton was just exhibited as an anonymous equus cabolus, you know, next to an anonymous rabbit and an anonymous rat um, in, the, in the Hall of uh, Osteology, uh, Hall of Mammals, you know. So, um, so there was a little fall from grace there. And then after people got bored with those and wanted interactive exhibits, the skeleton was stuffed up in the attic of the Natural History Museum until the International Museum of the Horse said, hey, and waved their hand and said, if you give it to us, we'll make it the centerpiece of an exhibition on the history of the thoroughbred and why the state, why, why the state of Kentucky is, you know, the heartland of thoroughbred breeding because it all goes back to this one horse, Lexington. They cleaned the bones, they made repairs, they got it ready to travel and and there was and they changed the the skeletal structure to to make it correct, right? I mean there were there were even some anomal yes, anomalies. That that is that's where the novelist's imagination comes in because <laughs> one of my characters is an osteopreparator. And while it is true that the original mount has errors in it, because Thomas Scott, the painter who had painted this horse many, many times and knew a thing or two about horse anatomy, was very critical that they had given the, the skeleton to be mounted by a guy who had never seen the horse alive. And he said that there were several flaws. So when I'm talking about the wonderful work of osteo preparators and I have to say it was so much fun to go to the Smithsonian and see this work in progress. Um, the most fascinating thing, you're in an extremely high-tech lab where they've got everything that opens and shuts in terms of scientific equipment but cleaning bones is still done in a kind of a gigantic um, something like a refrigerator only warm because bugs clean bones. We yes. haven't come up with a better way of doing it than just having bugs eat the flesh off because it does the least damage to the tissue and leaves the most scientific information to be gleaned. Geraldine Brooks is the author of the new novel, Horse. It is published by Viking. We were talking about Jarrett's story and as the the groom and, and trainer of this horse, ultimately, and the advocate, right? The, the one voice for the horse and the one who worries about the horse and is, is taking the most care and understanding of the animal. And they not only have this, for want of a better term, a professional relationship, but very much an emotional relationship. So that was, uh, you know, I took my own experience with my own horse and took all the feelings that I have about crossing the species barrier with a horse and gave that all to Jarrett because I do think they are the most exquisitely sensitive animals. And if you can have a relationship of trust with a good horse, it, it's just such a life enriching thing. So I wanted to communicate that. And I imagine that anyone who works closely with horses mm. at, for their career uh, has to sense this as well. You say communication, but the communication between the animal and the human is, is fascinating. It's so innate. Well, you know, they're very direct in the way they communicate. There's a tremendous honesty to horses, you know what they're thinking, and they'll let you know. <laughs> mm. um, and uh, and that that language of equus is is a fascinating 
language to immerse yourself in. Without giving too much or giving anything away in the novel, there is a character in the book later on, Theo, who we read about. And this brings this story uh, to a contemporary, it's a contemporary story, of course, but it, it also allows us to see really through Theo where we've come after reading in such vivid detail about Jarrett's point. Well, I I realized, you know, that if I was going to write about the brutalities of the slave system and all the suffering that was engendered because of it in our past, I couldn't pretend that that story is over and done with. Because as I was writing this book, the drumbeat of news was deafening. It was the time of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor and just so many reminders that the story of racial injustice is not over in this country. You know, this is not... You know, we had a black president, that doesn't make it a post-racial society, and it doesn't mean we still haven't got a tremendous amount of work to do to fight the poison of racial injustice in this society. So it would have been very dishonest to just leave all that in the 19th century and pretend that the 21st century isn't still grappling with that legacy. It seems as though it would be impossible but every book, I'm sure, has its story as to how you came to it and, and how it develops over time. But you wrote this book and you started it while your husband was alive. He passes very suddenly. Uh, Tony Horwitz, uh, a, an amazing writer, a guest on this show many times, and who, while you're writing the book and that has to play into the writing of how you on how you work on a project like this. Well, it certainly did. It was such a shocking, uh, I mean, any death is shocking, but this one really happened between one breath and the next without any warning whatsoever. Tony had a heart attack and he was, you know, as far as we were concerned, he was in, you know, perfect health and he went to the gym six days a week. But he was on book tour and he collapsed in the street. And uh, and that was, I was about halfway through this book and he had been a great enthusiast about this book because he loved the period so much and he was so familiar with it. And at times our research even intersected because he was writing his books, Spying on the South, about the journeys of Frederick Law Olmsted, which took him into the horse country of Kentucky and even into some of the same homes of people who are connected with Lexington. So he would bring me wonderful finds from the archives and, you know, give me all kinds of great advice about the period and where to look for interesting things. And so it it felt um, uh, very heavy to, you know, I couldn't return to writing the book for quite a while after he died. And it was about a year, I would say, when I just couldn't get, into the kind of focus that you need. But a friend of mine who had lost her husband had got some good advice by uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of all Mm. people, who said, uh, do your work. It might not be your best work, but it will be good work, and it will be what will save you. And so eventually, eventually I took that advice and went back to work on it, and I really felt... Tony's presence very much uh, as as I finished the book and, you know, often running up to his library to check on things because he had such an extensive collection of books on this period. The relationship between the two, given your careers as correspondents and as writers who who often had different paths, but as you say, they often overlapped to have that very close relationship of, of working on a project this big and this intense uh, for a part of it solo, I would think would be, yeah, would, would, would be 
a disorienting experience. It was disorienting, but you know, I, I, I think there's something that happens to you after you go through a kind of a grief like that. And I think it opens you up to other people's suffering. And I think that there was uh, a deeper understanding of my character's pain that came from my own pain. So there's that, you know. The book is dedicated for Tony. It will be the past and we'll live there together. Patrick Phillips, heaven. It's a beautiful way to dedicate the the novel. Do you, as you work on now and, and are talking about the book and, and so many fascinating, I mean, this is what I loved about this book, Geraldine, is that as we've evidenced by the last 26 minutes, there's so many different things to talk about in this story, which just must be so exciting for you that there were so many strands to the story. Well, I did love it, you know, because I I was an art history major. <laughs> and so I loved uh, when I discovered that there was an art connection to the story. So that's two things. I love horses and art. And I was able to get deep in those weeds and then also finding about finding out about the science at the Smithsonian because I love as a as a former newspaper reporter, I just love getting up in other people's business. So that was that was a great <laughs> treat too. You I'm fifty four years old. You started writing when you were fifty three. <laughs> yes, I don't recommend that. Start early. Geraldine Brooks is the author of Horse, a novel. It is published by Viking. Geraldine Brooks, what a great pleasure and honor to speak to you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. A great pleasure. Thank you. Geraldine Brooks' new novel is Horse. It is published by Viking. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program. Book Marcus 